So can we get the slides on the screen? Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two eminent scholars who kind of got the whole ball rolling in the academic approach to ancestral health. And um, I'm not gonna say a lot because I don't want to eat into their time, uh, but Boyd Eaton has spoken at our conference for the past two years, uh, but it's really our privilege now to have Mel Connor, the, uh, one of the other members of this book, The Paleolithic Prescription, which I got when I was in college in the late 80s, and I still have, um, to come and speak to us about The Paleolithic Prescription. Uh, Mel Connor is a, a professor and MD, and he knows more about anthropology than anybody I know, even though I've studied with anthropologists. And what's amazing is he even knows about human development and comparative issues. He's just the, the most broad, not, uh, knowledgeable person I've ever met. So Mel, would you please come up here?
uh, notice it says, uh, and, and when you increase, <coughs> when you change the conditions from the ones that, that we evolved in, you get more individuals manifesting certain diseases. And notice it's, I put industrial conditions in a box. And um, <coughs> I know that, um, that there's a lot of evidence for a decline in health at the origin of agriculture. And I, I believe in that. But there's a much more dramatic change in the environment that takes place uh, uh, with the Industrial Revolution and in, in, in the last couple of centuries. And I'll come back to that. Okay, now I can't advance the slides of this. Okay, so now that's not changing. <coughs> But it, it, it did uh, take a very scientific approach to a certain category of, of excellent people in the 20th century and, and tried to study them as possible models of a, of a range of, of conditions during which uh, humans evolved. evolved. Um, <clears throat> contrary to the, some claims, this was not a racist idea, it was not an attempt to, to put uh, uh, or gatherers in some sort of uh, uh, more primitive or lower category uh, than other people, it, it, which, we, which we were accused of regularly by postmodernists and, and, uh, and others. <coughs> but just to study people in the environment in which they were uh, designed, which we were designed to live in. And, uh, and so we went forward uh, with that agenda. Sorry, this is this is quite disorienting. Um, <clears throat> the the um, uh, the agenda was challenged uh, for its own sake, and was also uh, it, it was also um, expanded and, and and became more varied. Uh, and uh, and studies <clears throat> which were very limited, uh, relatively speaking, in the in the 
1960 Senate were intended to be restricted to uh, uh, to conventional ethnographies uh, became much more quantitative and, uh, and, and and more systematic and developed roots in evolutionary biology, uh, evolutionary ecology, ecology more generally, uh, 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 demography, and sophisticated measurements of of uh, behavior. So, um, I went to the uh, uh, to the Kalahari to join the uh, Harvard Kalahari expedition. Thank you. Uh, in nineteen. Uh, <laughs> all right. So you've seen this, and you know all about it. So and the basic idea. Uh, Origins are us, and still are, always were. So uh, this is uh, Richard Lee and Eric Devore, and the book I was talking about. And this cartoon says, very impressive, a hunting major with a gathering miner. Uh, and actually, uh, what was decided at the time, and in the Man the Hunter Conference, in spite of its name, was that this, this guy didn't have such an impressive resume, because he should have had a gathering major uh, uh, hunting <laughs> a few years later um, uh, to write the, uh, uh, the wrong. And in case you want to know, uh, whoops, sorry. in case oh, I pressed the wrong button. In case you want to know how the division of labor arose, she's saying, uh, on second thought, you hunt, I'll gather. And, uh, and uh, that's an actual uh, fact. So uh, what we know, what I, what I am going to try to convince you of today is that, that the division of labor was approximately equal, although it wasn't seen that way at the time. If you go to chapter nine of, of Frank Wallow's wonderful book, The Hadza, You'll see uh, the hope, the modal hunter gatherers, which will, which I will come back to. And this was the hunter gatherer party line. Basically, uh, the 10,000 BC, everybody in the world was doing this. And now there's, in the 20th century, there were a few places where you could still find people doing it, but only, only a few. And uh, it's important to understand that uh, some of them are in marginal environments. Uh, and that our work among the, the Kalahari Song or Kong or Dunkwasi is just one example of, uh, uh, of this international spectrum. The <coughs> semi arid, uh, and, uh, this is the environment semi arid with the rain, with rainfall, uh, not, not uh, of a desert type, but, but not, not great. Uh, and uh, sandy soil with sparse, sparse vegetation and all kinds of game. Uh, <coughs> And here you see uh, a group of uh, Nkwasi doing the, one of their quintessential things, which is moving. So the average hunter-gatherer group moves six to seven times a year. Uh, here's a, a, a group that's hunting the results of the hunt. Uh, and yours truly, oops, practicing the well-known anthropological method of participant interference. And uh, as you can see, I must have been, you know, I must have been living and eating better in those days than I am now. But uh, there's also a lot of, of, of routine stuff in hunting. You spend a lot of time making making arrow, bows and arrows, putting poison on them, uh, uh, looking for eggs to steal from birds, setting traps. This is a 14-year-old boy who's caught a bird. They're waiting for an ant bear to come out of a hole. They waited all day unsuccessfully that occasion. And the gathering is also very, very, you see uh, a berry picking expedition here. You also see men picking berries, which they always do when they're not uh, successful in, in the hunt. And, and also doing other types of uh, uh, gathering. But the, the, the staff of life for this particular group is Mongongo nuts. Uh, and these are Mongongo pictures of Mongongo you know, groves where women are are um, uh, carrying, picking up nuts, carrying chil children and up to thirty pounds of nuts. 
And I'm not going to go through this in detail. It's a very nutritious uh, uh, food. It's got uh, it's got an outer layer of, of uh, delicious fruit, which is used to make a, a sort of a broth of sort of applesauce consistency. And it's very hard to get to the to the the real meat of the matter, which is this not an uh, insight uh, to shells. Uh, and the way that's done with uh, uh, was done with uh, uh, these, these stones, the the, uh, I, I, the, 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 the skill uh, uh, takes a long time to learn. Women, it's been shown that w women get better at this until they're in their mid, mid to late forties, when they peak in <coughs> in their ability in nut cracking. And I I tried it many times and soon concluded that I. If I were plunked down in the middle of a mangango nut grove, I would I would die with bleeding fingers before I, I would get enough to eat. So it's not easy. And there are other, uh, of course, basic subsistence needs like water, which, which determines how how people disperse across the landscape. And uh, and these are this is a typical grass hut form, uh, and a family in front of the hut. A lot of time is spent that way. Um, and the the uh, main focus of my research at the time was infancy and, and childhood, and the uh, uh, mechanism of birth spacing. What you see here is uh, a three-year-old nursing. Uh, this is a proportion of children still nursing at different ages. It is uh, uh, approximately a three-year uh, uh, timing of, of weaning, very late weaning and very frequent nursing resulting in four-year birth spacing with suppressed ovarian function. So what were they being weaned to? Hence, uh, not this, and uh, I'll tell you more about that later. Here, here's uh, scenes of children involved in subsistence activity, a group of children of different ages, in which the oldest is digging a tuber, uh, imitation of carrying, this little girl has has uh, uh, killed a bird. She has a gigantic smile on her face. I hope you can see that. Uh, a, uh, and it's very proud of herself. An American child would be referred for treatment. <laughs> so there are important cultural differences. And this is other types of play uh, of children. Uh, they spend a lot of time playing. It means they're well nourished enough to have energy to, to, to play quite a lot. Uh, and so food, clothing, and shelter, I wish there was some way we could simplify our life. Um, that's wrong. Uh, life is actually much more complicated. People are concerned about adornment. People have, have uh, religious beliefs and a trance ritual. People invest, uh, I would say, as much in relationships as they do in subsistence. And people have very individual uh, characters. Um, just a slide to show you that even in the 70s, cultural change was beginning for these people. So Thomas Hobbes said, life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But in reality, hunter-gatherer life is anything but solitary. It's poor by, but by whose standards? And it's not, it's, it's adequate, not desperate. It's not nasty or brutish, but full, humane, skillful, spiritual, varied, and funny. And it's short for some, long for others. Um, typical pre-modern mortality, and we'll come back to that. So here's the first version of ancestral health. I moved to Atlanta in 1983. I had the, the tremendous good luck to be approached by this gentleman, uh, who you'll be hearing from in a little while, um, <coughs> to, to try and um, study and characterize uh, uh, hunter-gatherer diets throughout the world. And he, he had done a lot of work on this already. And in this, this uh, he also convinced me to, submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine, which I thought was a waste of time, but uh, they, they accepted it and published it. Uh, and uh, this was our estimate of macronutrients uh, and a few micronutrients <coughs> in the uh, late Paleolithic diet based on, not on archeological studies, but on um, excellent 20th century hunter-gatherers, comparing it to the contemporary American diet and current recommendations. Uh, the late Paleolithic uh, diet um, was higher, uh, we thought, than was higher in protein, uh, uh, lower, much lower in fat, uh, much higher in polyunsaturated and saturated fat ratio, 
approximately equal in cholesterol, much higher in fiber, and much, much lower in sodium. And uh, most of those uh, generalizations, I would say, remain true. But I'll come back to that. Uh, so here's here's another graph that came out. By the way, this was a, this was a later version that came of the same chart that was published in the New England Journal that came out in our 1988 book. This is um, an animal vegetable ratio uh, and the and the resulting uh, macronutrient distributions. So just to show you that from the beginning, uh, we knew that there was a range of of, uh, uh, of animal to vegetable. Um, ratios in different hunter gatherers, and uh, at the time we put the the mean <coughs> uh, somewhere around 35, 65, and uh, and that has changed. Um, so here's the three authors of uh, uh, the Paleolithic prescription, uh, and Marjorie uh, uh, has passed on, um, and boy, uh, uh, and I'm still here. And boy, the still here, both of us getting getting older and older. Um, but it was a great project to to work on together. Now, when the first paper was published, the media had a lot of fun. Uh, so we had check ads for specials on saber toothed tiger, tigers in in the Atlantic Constitution, USA Today, Caveman cooked up a healthy diet. The Caveman Diet in the Washington Post, it's in the, in the edit, main editorial column. They said, so count on this. Someday in the near future, you'll look out at daybreak and see people all up and down your street come loping out of their homes wearing designer skins and we're wielding LL Bean stone axes while every dog, cat, and squirrel in the neighborhood runs for cover. Uh, and this is a column on, uh, in the Boston Globe by, by a very famous columnist, uh, Alan Goodman. <laughs> who said, do I sound suspicious? This is their conclusion of this back to primeval basics movement. The truth is I fully accept my genetic ancestors as health mentors. Some of them did develop medical problems, lion bite, for instance, <laughs> we rarely see in the civilized world. But I am convinced that the average Paleolithic person was a very role model of good health when he died at the ripe old age of 32. And then <clears throat> Newsweek uh, reviewed our book uh, uh, pretty favorably, but the cartoon ca caption says, you figure it. Everything we eat is 100% natural, yet our life expectancy is only 31 years. I don't have to explain to the people in this room uh, the fundamental error that's been made in those two places. Uh, it, it, the, the, uh, uh, the, the age estimates are determined mainly by infant and early childhood mortality, and those who live a full life are the ones who have interest and escape uh, death from infection are the ones who are of interest to us. Stone Ages in the Fast Land was also published in, in uh, 1988. You showed uh, uh, serum cholesterol was under 150, uh, aerobic fitness was high, type 2 diabetes was low, and there was no increase with blood pressure with age. And so here's here's uh, the tricep skin fold measurement, the average for all these different kinds of so-called primitive people and the average for industrialized Westerners. The uh, maximum uh, O2 intake, Canadian Caucasians uh, versus uh, the, the various kinds of, uh, of pre-industrial people. Diabetes prevalence, uh, of course, now is, is 10 or, or higher in Western countries. Uh, so we're at the top of that range and, and going up and it's a very, type 2 diabetes very rare in these kind of populations. But notice too that, the, and hunter-gatherers have all have uh, cholesterol, serum cholesterol below 150, mostly a lot below, and we didn't have fractionation of cholesterol in those days. But notice that the rudimentary horticulturalists and actually simple agriculturalists also have, almost all of them, uh, their cholesterol is under uh, 150, and, and that's true of the other measures as well. So it's not just the hunter-gatherers that were, were superior. <clears throat> we know we knew at the time that there was an epidemic of, of uh, coronary artery and other uh, atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease, and the uh, the uh, epidemic was was not yet beginning to to abate. And about about half of this uh, decline in actual deaths uh, 
between uh, 1970 and 2000 has been attributed by epidemiologists now to, to lifestyle changes. Um, so uh, at least a half a million projected deaths a year um, have been prevented by lifestyle changes, which I, we like to think we contributed a little bit to. Uh, now, of course, we have uh, some things have improved, but other things haven't. And uh, I don't need to tell you uh, what we're facing in the future. Uh, you have here uh, uh, the graph of, uh, of, of ob obesity prevalence and the graph of diabetes prevalence. And you can almost feel the, the diabetes graph being dragged up like the, the uh, obesity one. And uh, so in the middle of this, uh, three years ago, we published uh, an anniversary paper, uh, Paleolithic Nutrition, and uh, uh, concluded that a lot of things held up, that, that uh, hunter-gatherers had much, Paleolithic people had much lower levels of refined carbohydrates and sodium, much higher levels of fiber and protein, and much higher levels of physical activity, or at least higher levels of physical activity. And this was our, our, our update not quantitative, but very clear. A contemporary Western diet compared to hunter-gatherers have all these very important differences. Um, and uh, and I won't go through the chart, but uh, uh, that represents a very big change in, in diet. We were also interested in, in changing recommendations and in particular, what, <clears throat> what changes were made in the recommendations that, that actually went in the direction of what we had always said was uh, the ancestral um, uh, estimate. And so you have uh, recommendations. And, 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 and by the way, they weren't changing because we said so or because they were interested in hunter-gatherers. They were changing because of epidemiological laboratory and, and clinical trials. But they were changing in our direction. And uh, so you see that happening in added sugar and fiber, which didn't even have a recommendation, wasn't even on the radar in, uh, in 1985. Uh, protein increase allowed at least, uh, sodium, potassium, uh, respectively, uh, uh, recommendations decreased and increased, uh, so the ratio uh, increased, and also uh, biomarkers uh, like blood pressure, serum cholesterol, um, and, and others, all going in the direction that we had advocated, not on the basis of the ancestral estimates, but on the basis of other evidence. And uh, very importantly, the era of uh, randomized controlled trials uh, of, of, of these ideas has begun with uh, Lindbergh and colleagues uh, showing, for example, that uh, paleolithic diet or uh, 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 proofs, uh, it beats a Mediterranean diet in helping diabetics uh, with their cardiovascular disease predictors. And uh, so the, they included lean meat, fish, fruits, vegetables, root vegetables, eggs, and nuts versus whole grains, low-fat dairy products, vegetables, fruits, and fish. And they got a, uh, a substantial uh, improvement in, in glucose tolerance. Uh, in the uh, uh, Paleolithic group, uh, but not in the Mediterranean group, and, and uh, several other measures, uh, 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 lipids uh, showed similar uh, results. And there have been a couple of other studies. Okay, so now, some challenges. <laughs> there have been a lot of challenges. I was taught that you, when you have hypothesis, you, you should not just marshal all the evidence in favor of it, but marshal all the evidence that's been proposed against it. And uh, that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk doing. I hope Aaron will uh, let me make up for the time that I lost back there. So first of all, how fleshy are, are the diets? Uh, Boyd, together with Lauren Cordain and others, <coughs> uh, did a, a, an impressive study in which they estimated the distribution of meat dependence in 229 uh, hunter-gatherers from the ethnographic uh, atlas, and they they put a uh, a modal number uh, uh, in the 55 to 65 percent range. Uh, but, but but the problem with this, from from my perspective, is that this sample is is not anthropologically sound. 
uh, because it includes, and that criticism has been made by others, it includes quite a few, um, whoops. Okay. Like top carnivores, 
We have longer guts than they do, and we need vitamin C from plants. The fossil human dental calculus shows uh, consumption of plant foods. Archaeological record is biased toward bone and grain grinding goes back at least 30,000 years. Actually, uh, see, it goes back much longer than that. So carnivory changed the hominin diet, but against the background of plant foods, which dominate the diet of all higher primates. <laughs> Uh, Rick Potts uh, oh, uh, and others always emphasize environmental variability as the key selective force on, on human evolution. Uh, and Allison Brooks and others have been finding uh, uh, incredibly interesting material in Africa with grindstones going back 280,000 years and uh, shellfishing at, at least 160. And uh, uh, Mary Steiner and others have pointed a big increase in diet diversity at 70,000 years, including small package game and, uh, 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 and a wider range of plant foods. So the conclusion uh, that the paleo diet is bunk uh, is false, or rather it's maybe true uh, about a straw man, uh, which she sets up, and others have done the same. Uh, but but uh, with the caveat that I think that real Paleolithic diets were much more varied than some people claim. Challenge, next challenge, ancient atherosclerosis. This is uh, uh, the so-called Horus study named after an Egyptian god. And this is a 2013 publication showing a lot, substantial amounts of atherosclerosis in, uh, in mummies in various different cultures. Here you see carotid artery uh, calcium uh, deposits in, in uh, a Yunangan woman, uh, which is an Eskimo group from the late 19th century and, uh, and an Egyptian scribe. And what I want to do is just uh, start by, by comparing that to, um, uh, to studies in, uh, uh, in the West. The red circles show you uh, uh, the line between no, atheros no atherosclerosis and some atherosclerosis in, uh, in uh, women and men uh, in the, uh, I don't have a, a, my notes here, I think this is called the Meads or Mears study. Uh, at any rate, that is, uh, uh, is lower. And then this is a study in Rotterdam uh, showing uh, a community study showing 3% uh, of, of individuals uh, <coughs> with no calcification at, at, uh, at an older mean age. So if you take their graph uh, from the Horace study, and this is the dot Horace, uh, and plot the, uh, the first uh, point, you get almost twice as much atherosclerosis, even if you accept their, their estimate. And if you plot the Rotterdam point out here, you get um, a continuing increase in, uh, in calcium deposits. Um, and so uh, it seems that uh, the god Horus is still protecting the Egyptians. Uh, but one, one also doesn't have to accept these mummies as representative of of anything to do with the, the, the formative period of our evolution. <coughs> but even if you do, there's a very large increase in Western pop population. So here, here's the claim uh, that, and this is a very strong claim, that the disease is an inherent component of human aging. And uh, that claim is unwarranted based on these data. What about salt? This was a uh, front page article by Gina Colada. Uh, she always does this because this news, it, the New York Times, but it's, there still has to be news and you have, still have to stake out an extreme position. You can see what it was called. Uh, and they even decided to write a main column editorial calling attention to doubts about restricting salt. And, uh, and, and I think it was uh, quite irresponsible of them. The American Heart Association immediately issued a media alert saying the report, the IOM report, which is what they were referring to at the time, is missing a critical component of constant review well-established evidence uh, relating uh, sodium to high blood pressure and heart disease. 
And even the president of the Institute of Medicine, Harvey Feinberg, wrote to the uh, uh, Catherine Sebelius and, and someone else from the IOM wrote to the Times to clarify their position, uh, saying uh, uh, that all the uh, evidence is Congress supporting a population-wide reduction in current levels of sodium intake. There's another China study, the salt, sub, uh, salt substitution study, Substituting potassium for, for sodium, and only 25% of the salt used, and uh, got a, uh, a three or four uh, millimeter of mercury uh, de decrease in this uh, randomized uh, intervention in, in, uh, in, in a year. A summary of three uh, meta analyses. This was done in uh, 2013, uh, coming to the same conclusion, and a uh, one of those meta-analyses by Nancy uh, uh, Alberto, uh, producing very strong evidence from a great many studies uh, with the conclusion that high quality evidence and non-acutely ill adults shows that reduced sodium intake reduces blood pressure and has no adverse effect, contrary to what the Times and the Island said, uh, and um, uh, that lower sodium intake uh, is also associated with a reduced risk of stroke. Uh, heart attack. So the claim is that, the claim is false, and uh, you know a reduction of three to four millimeters of systolic blood pressure was was belittled, but when you get that in one year, what do you get in, in a decade uh, or three decades? And also a few studies have ever tested salt intake consistent with the uh, hunter gatherer level, which is an order of magnitude lower than ours. Okay, very quickly now, Hansa uh, ac activity level study challenged the idea that um, activity, uh, a sedentary lifestyle, uh, contributes to uh, our obesity problem. And uh, again, uh, Ponzer himself, the author, first author, decided to go to the New York Times uh, to debunk the hunter gatherer workout and, uh, and drew the exaggerated conclusion that, that uh, uh, activity levels don't matter. For obesity. Um, very nice uh, uh, blog on statistical epidemiology criticized this and uh, been in correspondence with the guy Darren Dolly. He's <coughs> maybe going to, uh, to write this up for a scientific paper, but they say that the, um, he says that, that they're just wrong because they adjusted for body size. They made an elementary mistake. Smaller people expend much less energy. This is simple physics. Uh, and uh, uh, but but activity levels are, are are higher, and he goes on to say how any responsible scientist could risk sending the message that physical activity isn't important is beyond me. That's his, his blog. This is the claim, uh, and a quote from Herman Ponser: <clears throat> "We're getting fat because we eat too much, not because we're sedentary. It's unsubstantiated and has nothing to do with really their study. And the truth is, we're getting fat to be." Of both. There's a lot of evidence for that. So, recent genes, a claim that there's been so much genetic change uh, in the last 10,000 years that all bets are off about the discordance model and you can sort of uh, forget it. And this is ongoing evolution and we're adapting to, to everything. Uh, and uh, there's lot, there are lots of studies now. This one was published in 2013. Uh, showing uh, the recent origin of most human protein coding variants, 73% of all protein coding uh, single nucleotide variants arose in the past five to 10,000 years. The trouble is that they don't have any relevance to, to the thing that most of us are interested in, with the exception of lactase uh, um, and, and uh, uh, lactose tolerance. Um, and this is a, a, a paper that came out this month in Nutrition Reviews um, by two Emory former graduate students uh, beyond the paleolithic prescriptions making similar points. And uh, one of their points is everyone uh, uh, has ignored the gut microbes. Uh, and they are very, very important, rapidly evolving. And it's pretty embarrassing that we've waited so long to study them. So the claim is there can't be a mismatch because evolution has never stopped. That's unsubstantiated, 
and uh, there's no evidence of the kind of genetic evolution that would protect us against the epidemic chronic diseases of modern time. So last thing is some recommendations. This is the old food guide pyramid. This is the Mediterranean pyramid. <clears throat> this is the first approximation of the, of the Paleolithic pyramid. Uh, with a question mark over dairy products because of uh, uh, lactose intolerance being dominant in our species. Uh, an emphasis on, on uh, activity, including walking. By the way, one of the, one of the myths in the, uh, in the time uh, we started was that you had to have highly aerobic activity. You had to get your, your heart rate up above 140, 150. Uh, to, to get exercise, and this seemed to exclude half the human hunter-gatherers uh, who were walking, not running, walking, carrying, and so on. Uh, so um, that turned out, we turned out to be right about that too. Of course, this was a big uh, uh, factor. And now today, the current approximation, uh, I would say we underestimated the originally the amount of meat uh, that, and, and uh, and other protein, other animal flesh uh, uh, protein and fat, but that I would now um, put a, a bigger emphasis on, on fish, uh, which the archeological record is clearly showing. And also uh, some additions that hunter-gatherers didn't necessarily have. Um, so I don't only go by, by that. Take home lessons. We're omnivores, adapted for a range of diet. The range is not limited, limitless. We shouldn't have high, uh, high levels of refined carbohydrates, salt, or saturated fat. I know the breakfast tells me that you don't agree on uh, that last one. We shouldn't have low levels of the uh, polyunsaturated and saturated fat ratio, or of omega 3 fatty acids of fiber. And we're not adapted for a sedentary lifestyle, tobacco use, or high ethanol intake. And this is always a take home lesson. Uh, nothing biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So, Boyd, come up and say everything that I did wrong. <laughs>
<coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the China study says it should be no more than 10% uh, of the caloric intake from protein. Well, that's not true for uh, any of the uh, primate species that have been studied. They all get more than 10% of their uh, nutrients from uh, protein. Uh, the upper theoretical limit set by the capacity of the liver to metabolize amino acids is uh, higher than what we calculated was for our ancestors in the past. Uh, so that uh, we are within the biological limits to that are available to us. Uh, we are also, the ION that Mel was speaking of, the Institute of Medicine, uh, gives an upper limit of 35% of energy from uh, protein and found no problem with uh, protein consumption and any of the health issues that have sometimes been associated with or claimed to be the result of protein consumption. As far as this, uh, these claims are concerned, uh, dental plaque studies are coming to be very interesting because it's something that hasn't been looked at in the past and it's, uh, it's really a source of information that uh, hasn't been used and it offers a lot of promise for the future. Uh, it's certainly not surprising that Neanderthals and other pre-agricultural uh, people ate plant foods as our hunters and gatherers we said never ate 50 percent of their uh, basic energy from uh, from plants, so it's, it's not surprising that our ancestors did as well. Uh, these plaque studies show that uh, there was a deterioration in dental health anyway with the uh, onset of agriculture and that, that deterioration has progressed considerably uh, since the industrial revolution and I think uh, dental health is a, uh, a hallmark or indicator, uh, the canary in the coal mine or other kinds of health problems that have resulted from these changes in the past. Um, the bone collagen studies are very interesting. They show that Neanderthals and late Paleolithic humans were both operating as top level carnivores. The difference was that after a while, uh, behaviorally modern humans began to widen their uh, scope of hunting activities and gathering activities and were able to get more of the smaller animals like rabbits and things of that sort than the uh, earlier uh, humans could. But uh, they were both consuming large amounts of uh, um, animal foods. The use of grains does go way back a long way, but it really becomes a substantial component of the diet only in the period just before the uh, agricultural evolution. revolution. And the reason for this is very simple. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to transform grains into an edible form. Grain, as it comes off the plant, is not digestible. It has to be ground up. And consequently, grinding is such a hard job with the technology that they had available, the grains were used only in uh, times of real nutritional dep deprivation, which fortunately, partners and gathers are quite rare. Uh, much more uncommon to have a starvation period for hunters and gatherers than for some subsequent farming communities. Uh, what I think that, that just not paleo uh, article should have talked about was a huge difference in the amount of plants that we get now. Fruits and vegetables uh, composed a major element in our ancestral diet, but are much less uh, common in our present diet. That means that we're getting fewer phytochemicals, much less antioxidant activity than our ancestors were. And of course, we now have far greater amounts of refined carbohydrates and sugar than our ancestors did. The Hadza uh, are a sort of an atypical group because they eat a tremendous amount of honey It happens to be available in their area. But uh, for the most part, our ancestors got honey only infrequently. As far as atherosclerosis is concerned, as Mel pointed out, the groups that were being described in this article, for the most part, are anything but hunters and gatherers. They're very uh, technologically advanced uh, societies. The one group that uh, were hunters and gatherers were the Anagans, or what more commonly called the Aleutians. That's the Russian name for them. Uh, the Aleuts, unfortunately for them, were expert at uh, hunting fur seals. And consequently, the Russians quickly picked up on this, moved in, and started getting them not only 
just hunting them. They, they actually forced them to go out and, and bring in more and more fur seals, for which they gave them uh, Western supplies, very much uh, including tobacco, which was a very uh, prominent component of their lifestyle, something they really would trade furs for for a long, long time before the, uh, the uh, skeletal remains or the, uh, the mummies that were, that were studied with, uh, C, with CT scanning to see what sort of uh, uh, coronary atherosclerosis and generalized atherosclerosis they had. So this is a this is a hunting and gathering group, but it's very atypical because, amongst other things, they had a great deal of uh, tobacco available in their lifestyle. <coughs> this is very quick. Uh, the real hunters and gatherers and, and societies that did not have um, uh, access to commercial salt uh, get very very little, less than a gram a day, perhaps, whereas we Americans get, on the average, about three and a half grams a day. And what this shows you is that in the upper extent, where almost all the studies have been done in the, that are presented in the conventional literature, they're in the range where there's very little change with when you reduce sodium. You have to reduce it down to the level that our hunter-gatherer ancestors consume to really see a population that does not have high blood pressure. As far as Hadza activities, I draw your uh, attention to the bottom two lines there. If you compare the uh, total energy exposure ex uh, expenditure per kilogram of body weight, what you see is that the hunters and the Hansa have substantially more uh, physical activity uh, than uh, per kilogram of weight than Westerners do. And if you look at the column on walking, what you, you can see why that's the case. Uh, Men and women both walk substantially more than Americans do. Hawks and other people who talk about this in great extent, this is a comment by John Hawks. To appreciate this, you have to think that um, the uh, we now are more different from uh, the Sumerians who created the alphabet and built ziggurats and introduced irrigation and so forth, then they were different from the uh, Neanderthals. And I would say that the greatest difference by far in the way people were living uh, was between the Neanderthals and uh, the Sumerians and other early people. The genetic changes between in those groups rather than between us and uh, the people who lived at that time. I hope I said that right because it is confusing. Um, the mutations that, that Mel spoke about affect, for the most part, single genes. Single gene uh, effects have very, very little uh, impact on uh, either form or function of the body. And they're widespread. You have to get many of these together in one individual to have a true biological effect. So that actually the most important natural selection tends to be the result of consistent evolutionary pressure over a very long period of time, thousands and thousands of years. Uh, I love the story of the cats, hui, and mice. So our ancestors are at least 50 million years back to our last common ancestor, and probably more than that. And still, the uh, relationship between nutrition, exercise, and obesity and diabetes is almost exactly the same uh, within these three species, indicating that the genes involved have been there for uh, 50 million years or more without any substantial change. So this is my version of the uh, Paleolithic uh, trying, uh, pyramid, nutritional pyramid. And uh, I would support that. This is for the uh, hardcore people and those who particularly need to benefit from this kind of thing. And I think that this is my take home message for everyone here.
Sodium intake from seafood, plants, and animals was uh, much higher than in like these interior living peoples like Hadza. I think the interesting thing about water is when you think about it, we um, consume very little free water. Probably 20% of the liquid that we consume or less is free water. After they were weaned, our ancestors consumed 100% of the liquid that they brought in as water. Now that to me, uh, free water, that to me seems like a uh, possible factor. As far as getting uh, uh, sodium from seawater and that sort of thing, uh, I think that's probably not very important. Uh, I'd like to talk with anybody who is a marine biologist as to what uh, animals, that, whales for example, or uh, seals, uh, how do they get around the salt that you they would take in with uh, the food they consume, but I doubt it's very important for the ancestral humans. So I, I have to say that I, I don't think we know. Um, we certainly know that there, there's a very important site that, that Aaron studied, the uh, um, 164,000 year old site near uh, the South African coastline, uh, and uh, it would give evidence of tremendous uh, shelf issues, but. You have to ask yourself if they were going down to the sea all the time, and if they wanted salt, you just put it in a container, let it evap let the water evaporate, and they have sea salt. Uh, and so, I can't rule that out. Although I think that most of, of uh, human evolution, most of the evidence we have for the formative part of human evolution is, it's it's increasingly uh, uh, has to do with waterways, but but fresh water. Um, like ri riverine environments and lacustrine environments. And, but it, it's a very good question. Hi, my name is Mark Gibson. Um, my question actually, uh, maybe directed at Mel. I, a lot of this talk was about nutrition and physical activity, but I um, felt like another area you kind of teased out was that a lot of this activity of traditional peoples was um, Often tedious, a little boring, um, and you also mentioned there's sort of spirituality to it. So uh, I wonder if um, do you see that there's a need in this ancestral health movement for more discussion on the mental environment and what changes we've experienced uh, in modern life and how that relates to health. Yeah, so uh, that's a that's a great question. I've been thinking about it all my life. Uh, and when I first went to, to the Kong, I, I was more interested in uh, in mental health and and child development, child rearing environment and its impact on mental health than I than I was in, in nutrition and uh, and exercise. The uh, it has in my entire life of thinking about this, and I wrote a nine hundred some odd page book called The Evolution of Childhood. It was published in nineteen uh, two thousand ten. Um, and uh, I have not been able to to come across nearly as strong evidence in that domain for a mismatch in either of those domains, the mental health domain or the, or, or, or the child rearing domain. The consequences of a mismatch, as I think is very evident in nutrition and, and diet. Um, maybe we haven't studied it the right way, but uh, certainly uh, the importance of relationships, the importance of spirituality, the, the importance of face-to-face -face contact, and the, the ability to get away from people by, by that you're having arguments with, by, by splitting groups temporarily, like if, if, if there's water available elsewhere. The, these are all things that, that I, I think would be great if, if if the ancestral health movement thought more about them, but I 
would just caution you that you won't find <coughs> the kind of evidence in terms of modern studies, uh, uh, clinical studies, experimental studies, and so on, in that domain that you find in, in diet activity. Well, thank you very much. Put your hands together again for our speaker. Shake your antsies out, and then we'll be right back within five minutes uh, to start our next uh, talk.